My name is Taylor Shelton. I'm a student intern here at the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center. So today we have Stephanie Doherty and Andrea Thurler from the Mass General Gastroenterology Department. Uh, Stephanie is a gastroenterology nurse practitioner and senior mentor for the gastrointestinal inpatient services at Mass General. Andrea is also a gastroenterology nurse practitioner as well as the senior nurse leader for the MGHGI Associates, Advanced Practice Clinicians and Registered Nurses. So Stephanie and Andrea are here to talk about cyclic vomiting syndrome. So Dr. Brad Quo, um, he'll be joining us and he'll be here to answer any questions that you may have today. So please join me in welcoming them. All right, good afternoon everybody. Um, I want to just start before we uh, start our presentation to let you know that um, we will be recording today's presentation um, just for educational purposes. So um, with that, we'll get started. My name is Andrea Thurler. I'm a nurse practitioner in GI, as Taylor mentioned, and I take care of a lot of outpatients. Um, and then Stephanie Doherty. I take a lot of care of uh, inpatients, because I'm an inpatient. And so we thought this would be a nice talk to show the sort of seamless approach we have to patient care, both on the outpatient and inpatient side. And we're going to be talking with you today a little bit about um, cyclic vomiting and the care specifically in the adult population. And after our presentation, we'll have some time for questions. So please uh, keep those in mind as well. So we'll get started. Um, our presentation objectives today um, will introduce cyclic vomiting syndrome. How many in the room are familiar just by show of hands with cyclic vomiting syndrome? OK, so we have about three quarters of the room. That's excellent. Very good. Um, we'll define it. Um, we'll give you a little overview of like what does cyclic vomiting syndrome look like in the population. Um, and then we'll talk about the approach to patient care, so the outpatient considerations and the inpatient considerations for taking care of patients. Um, and then also talk a little bit about some of the research that we're doing. And then at the end, we'll talk about with some questions and feedback from the group. So cyclic vomiting syndrome. Cyclic vomiting syndrome is characterized by periods of nausea and vomiting with quiescent or um, well periods in between. So it's very um, particularly uh, unique in that regard that you have um, these periods that you're feeling so poorly, but then you completely feel well. So it's a little bit uh, interesting in that way. It was first described by Dr. Samuel Gee um, in 1882 in the pediatric population. However, in the adult population, um, it's relatively under-recognized and probably in the last 20 to 25 years has the literature really started to recognize um, or look into adult uh, research on patients with cyclic vomiting syndrome. And it's really considered to be a variant of migraine. So many of you have heard about um, abdominal migraine. So that kind of is synonymous in some ways with cyclic vomiting syndrome. But um, in many ways, you know, we do take a very thorough family history to kind of understand if there's any overlap of migraine and um, something that we should all consider uh, when we're taking care of these patients or our patients. So what does um, cyclic vomiting syndrome look like in the greater population? Um, the incidence or the rate of occurrence of newly diagnosed cases and the prevalence, the percent in a given population um, is really unknown in adults specifically. So one example that we looked at was a study recently done by SAGAR that showed that there was a prevalence in an outpatient clinic of about 11% of patients diagnosed with cyclic vomiting syndrome. But really interestingly, only 5% of those patients initially, before they even got to this, the GI clinic, were diagnosed accurately by their referring provider, despite actually meeting the criteria, which we'll talk more about, cyclic vomiting syndrome. So that's very interesting. So you have 11%, and at some level, you're actually missing about 6% of patients that truly have cyclic vomiting syndrome. <coughs> and so that was a more recent study done. So, when we talk a little bit about what, what are we seeing in the clinic and you know, what does the overall population um, of patients with cyclic vomiting syndrome look like, it does affect both males and females. Um, and we have seen a trend with 74% of adults um, with cyclic vomiting syndrome are female. Um, nationwide, it's about 63% white, 18% African American, and 6% Hispanic. Um, and so, one might say, well, in my clinic, I see more females than males, or more males than females. But again, this recent study looked to show um, some of these trends. And again, I can't emphasize enough that some of this research 
um, it's still relatively under-recognized, so we do need to have a lot more research to really um, appreciate the epidemiology. So how do we take care of um, patients with cyclic vomiting syndrome? It's an interesting question. So we talk about the outpatient and inpatient perspective. And <laughs> we're going to just kind of go through this with a case presentation, and we'll kind of weave this through as we talk a little bit more about cyclic vomiting syndrome. But we have a patient who's 18, male, with episodes of nausea and vomiting. It started about seven months ago um, when he started in college. And the episodes presented with abdominal fullness, nausea, diarrhea, and then sort of progressed into vomiting. And they lasted, the episode lasted two to seven days, worsened when he had like a really large meal, so like maybe after Thanksgiving, um, and high fat foods. He feels well in between the episodes, however, they seem to occur almost monthly at this point. And it resulted in four emergency room visits over the past seven months, and two of these um, required inpatient admissions. And he was given medicines upon arrival, which were morphine and Benadryl. So he's really not feeling good. He's having nausea, vomiting, really having abdominal pain, coming into the hospital, and the ER is kind of like, well, what do I do? So. Um, the current medications are multivitamin and Zoloft that he's taking. And just looking at his social history, we have um, no tobacco, drinks about two to three hard alcoholic beverages on the weekends, occasional marijuana use. Um, but he started smoking two months ago at the party, um, which helps when he has nausea symptoms. But remember, this is seven months ago that this was kind of starting. So marijuana use is relatively recent. Um, he's a freshman in college studying psychology, and he's hoping to get an internship at school next year, but he's pretty stressed out with all the work he has to do, as you can see here. So when we are, are seeing patients and we're talking about what we're going to kind of rule out before we rule in, um, we're going to have, um, he's going to undergo an abdominal CT scan, which was normal, an upper endoscopy, a little scope that looks down through your mouth, down your esophagus, into your stomach, and into the first part of your intestines and also um, undergoing some testing to make sure that the motility is okay. So we want to make sure that everything from gum to bum is actually moving through as it should. So um, is it slow? Is it rapid? These are all important factors that we uh, take into consideration. So this is the Rome 4 criteria and how we define cyclic vomiting. I'm not going to read the slide, um, but what I'm going to say to you is that some of the characteristics you really want to be aware of are these periods of having nausea and vomiting with these really well periods in between. I can't emphasize that enough. And this is chronic. So generally these, um, issue, these uh, symptoms have occurred in the last three months with an onset at least six months prior to diagnosis. And so the patients have these well periods and then they have the vomiting periods. Um, and then in addition, um, we, there's some milder symptoms. Sometimes people say I have a little bit of nausea in between. Um, and then the other piece that comes into play is, is migraine. So our recent um, criteria, the Rome 4 criteria, do, does include a personal or family history of migraines as supportive criteria. And you might say, well, what is the Rome 4 criteria? And it is a criteria um, looking at functional GI disorders, which basically talk about a little bit of um, sort of dysfunction in how the um, body works. It's not a structural, it's not a mass that's in the intestines, but it's kind of a, just a dysfunction um, of the uh, GI system. So that's the best way to kind of think about it. So we always hear about CHS, which is cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And sometimes that overlaps with cyclic vomiting syndrome. But I want to just bring this up today because it's very important because I think that question always comes up when many of you are looking into cyclic vomiting syndrome or trying to understand, like, is, is this patient or, is some, or am I smoking a lot of marijuana? Is this causing my symptoms? Oh wait, I've never smoked marijuana before and I just started, so like, how does that come into play? So marijuana is the most commonly used drug in the U.S. Um, and in 2004, we started appreciating CHS a little bit more um, as a sort of variant or sort of overlapping diagnosis to cyclic vomiting syndrome. It usually starts a year after chronic marijuana use. So as you saw the definition of chronic, it's about six months or so of use. And then uh, cyclic episodes of nausea and vomiting occur, very much like cyclic vomiting syndrome. Excessive hot showers and baths. Patients really rely on these hot showers to kind of really decrease the stimulation that their body is feeling when they're in these episodes. 
So when you're in an episode of cyclic vomiting, it is like a cyclone. You are just feeling so nauseous, vomiting, you just feel awful, you're in so much pain. The shower is key um, in many ways for patients that they're feeling like finally I get some relief. And um, Steph can probably attest even on the inpatient side that patients are asking, can I get a hot shower? Um, so it is important to think perhaps this is CHS, but it doesn't necessarily 100% mean it's not CVS. So I want to emphasize that too. And avoid opioid use. So opioids in many ways will, um, so opioids, things like narcotics, things are chronic pain medications, um, like Percocet, for example, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, can actually worsen um, pain and cause a ceiling effect where the patient requires more and more and more of these narcotics to feel better. So it's not that we don't want people to feel better, it's that we want to avoid a longer term pain problem in the future. So we always are scratching our heads, um, but we are always wanting to think and make sure we're ruling out other types of uh, concerns that present very similarly with nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain. And so I'm just giving a little bit of a list here of differentials that your provider um, may be considering when they're looking at your presenting symptoms of cyclic vomiting. So it's very important for your provider to take a careful history. When you're going in to see a, a provider, you really want to give them the full picture, the full story. When did this start? Um, how often does your vomiting occur? Is there a complete resolution of symptoms in between? Or are you constantly vomiting? What is the source? We're all trying to kind of figure that out. Was there an incipient event? So were you traveling somewhere? <laughs> Did you have a very stressful period in your life? A lot of patients will come to us and say, you know, people are telling me it's all in my head and I can't really explain why this is happening. And, and that in itself is a key point of information for your provider to understand, okay? So we de definitely, as we talked earlier, we definitely need to rule out um, and we, your provider will give some, do some objective testing, gastric emptying scan to make sure your stomach is emptying appropriately upper endoscopy and colonoscopy, using that scope that I talked about to look from above and below to make sure we're ruling out inflammatory concerns, any masses, anything else that could be contributing to your um, concern, your primary concern. Uh, CAT scan, take a, um, an image of your abdomen. Um, small bowel follow through, make sure your intestines are moving appropriately. And perhaps even MRI to look at the tissues at a closer level and what medications you're taking. So we need to understand what medications are um, being taken by everybody to make sure that we're not missing some sort of reaction to medication. So what are the treatment options? This is always a question. What, do I gonna, what am I gonna do? So this lovely diagram here, um, I was asked I think by Taylor earlier, is this cyclic vomiting or cyclic vomiting? And I told her both. Um, so this is our um, lovely image here about looking at the different phases of cyclic vomiting syndrome. So we have a little bicyclist here who is going through the phases and we're going to go into each of them. But it really is a good way to highlight kind of how things can go really up or they can kind of get really bad really quick. But then hopefully we can intervene in the middle here and kind of make things a little bit brighter for patients. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the outpatient considerations, and then Stephanie's gonna talk a little more closely about the inpatient. So you can really see the kind of seamless um, approach for patient care and things that you should be looking for when you're um, seeking care for uh, cyclic vomiting syndrome. So appropriate diagnosis, um, as we talked about, it speaks volumes when I presented that data about kind of looking at the overall population and how many patients are accurately diagnosed with cyclic vomiting. Um, regular follow-up every six months with your provider. Medication reconciliation, so making sure that all new medications are updated, any types of supplements, so prescription and non-prescription medications are known. Establishing an acute care plan, which um, Stephanie will talk a little bit more about, so that we can understand what type of care needs to happen when you come inpatient, because one thing, we would love to um, <coughs> spread your attacks further and uh, for far and fewer between, but we just need to be prepared when, if an episode is to happen. And it's key to initiate abortive therapies upon arrival to the hospital, so the acute care plan will speak to medicines that will essentially help calm your GI tract down to make your um, symptoms uh, reduced and eventually aborted. An IV hydration, sedation, and nausea medications, which we will um, be giving you when you come in. Sleep hygiene, very important to make sure you're getting enough sleep at night. 
Um, we do hear a lot, you know, it's hard to fall asleep, hard to stay asleep. These are really important things for your provider to know if this is happening to you and that you really just, your sleep isn't the way it was before. So some of the medicines that we're going to talk about can actually improve sleep as well. Good, good nutrition, so avoiding any triggering foods. Some patients will say that, um, you know, high fat foods, certain foods kind of trigger. Um, I wouldn't say exclusively a food is a causative factor for cyclic vomiting, but there could be triggers. Um, stress management, making sure that you have an outlet because we all have stress, but it's how we kind of uh, manage that stress that can give us the most uh, optimal outcomes. And avoiding triggers, um, again, so stress, alcohol, marijuana can be triggers, and really a strong support system. So I'm really actually very pleased in the room. I know um, without identifying specifically, but I know there are patients here, there are families here. There's a lot of supportive um, care that goes into this. So it's your provider, but also your support system, which is great. Um, and so uh, what do we actually treat on the outpatient side? How do we actually treat cyclic vomiting syndrome? So we actually do f start our first line. Um, to take a step back, we are trying to have a regimen where you're taking something every single day to reduce the frequency and severity of symptoms to keep you out of the hospital. So that's the main goal. And so what are those medicines that we could give you every single day to keep you out of the hospital? And our first line is um, the tricyclic antidepressants. Interestingly, um, despite the title, we actually are not using this for depression. Historically, they're more used for depression. Now we're actually using it um, at low doses to actually, again, reduce the severity and the frequency of attacks. And in many ways, it can also help with sleep um, and allow patients to sleep a little more comfortably, taking it at bedtime, um, and actually can really improve outcomes with cyclic vomiting. It helps um, stabilize the neurotransmitters. So you have all these different chemicals in your brain called neurotransmitters um, that are responsible for mood and sort of fight or flight. So um, kind of decreases that as well, which can also prevent attacks. And these are just some examples of different neurotransmitters, I'm sorry, different uh, tricyclic antidepressants. Other options, um, if TCAs fail, so we tend to use um, SSRIs, which are serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And all that basically means is it's a medicine that works on another uh, neurotransmitter, serotonin, to maintain the amount of serotonin in the brain, again, to reduce the frequency and severity of attacks on an everyday basis. Other things are beta blockers, um, which can reduce anxiety and also decrease your heart rate, um, which can be very helpful. And even antihistamines, which are a little more recognized in the pediatric population, but things like periactin um, serve as a sedative, sedative and anti-nausea. And sometimes you may notice um, you know, that your patients are, we see patients come in potentially on some of these medications, and it's not that it's the wrong thing, but there may be another opportunity to try something like a tricyclic that they may never have tried before. Um, other options, um, anticonvulsants, which help stabilize nerve membranes, and these are examples of those. And I know everyone has a handout too, so these are, this is a good reference point just for you to have. Other supplements, um, we hear people coming in with like L-carnitine, coenzyme Q10, <laughs> seen some benefits in the pediatric population um, in adults with migraines. And it also, they can help with cell function. Um, but again, there's not a lot of evidence and research to back it up, but if it's helpful, then we are, are for it. And so I'm gonna actually have Steph, Stephanie talk a little bit more about um, what happens now that you might be coming into the hospital and an attack is upon you? And so with that, Steph, thank you very thank much. You. Want to switch to you? Sure. Okay. So we'll start about, with the prodromal area. Prodromal phase is when you're at home and you're starting to feel maybe the attacks coming on. Um, you start feeling nauseous. You feel like you're in a vomit. So <coughs> we'll get to that. This is right before you go into the hospital. So first we'll have, probably have some medications that patients have at home that they're prescribed, such as Zofran, which helps with nausea. Um, and so you can start taking these medications at home, and then as well as benzodiazepines, such as Ativan, Thorazine, or Benadryl, which are also some medications that you guys can take at home. And so these medications patients will take at home to try to prevent the attack from coming on. Um, and then eventually, hopefully, the patient will be able to you know, fight off this attack and not have to come into the hospital, but sometimes you're not able to keep fluids down and not able to keep taking the medications by mouth, so eventually, sometimes you have to come into the hospital. Um, some other medications are anti-migraine medications, it's like Imitrex, and then um, also 
we also give, nar we try to avoid giving narcotics. So a lot of times patients will come into the hospital, they're having abdominal discomfort, nausea, vomiting, and the first thing the emergency room does is they give narcotics, which are pain medications, which isn't the best thing because although it may make you feel better for a little bit, it can cause um, worsening nausea um, as well because it decreases, it slows down the GI tract and the motility of the GI tract and can make a lot of your symptoms worse actually. So we try to avoid those as well. Other things that we do, um, once the patient comes into the emergency room, they get an IV because they're vomiting, they don't have to get any fluids down, they're dehydrated, they don't have to get any other medications in. So the first thing we want to do is get an IV in. Then they can get a lot of their medications through their IV. Um, medications that we like to give are benzodiazepines such as Ativan, uh, which we give um, to help relax um, and also help sleep. The, the goal is to have the patient sleep this, this episode off, and um, which is, can be difficult to do in the hospital. A lot of providers still are learning about cyclic vomiting syndrome, and a lot of times the patients actually are educating the providers um, on what cyclic vomiting is, and the goal during these attacks is to help the patient sleep off this attack and reset the whole entire um, autonomic nervous system and all the nerves of the GI tract. So we do that with benzos such as Ativan. Um, as well as antiemetics such as Zofran, we can also give through the IV to help with the nausea as well. And so ideally, um, other things that we can give are capsaicin, which is a topical um, lotion that we can give on the, the stomach, actually, because a lot of times when patients are having cyclic vomiting um, attacks, they'll have abdominal pain. And instead of giving narcotics, we'll try something to put on the belly that can also help with some of the pain. Um, hot showers. Um, in the hospital as well, a lot of patients and then can do, but also quiet, dark, private rooms are ideal, but a lot of times that's also not something that we have the luxury of getting um, as well. <coughs> so the first thing is um, the patient comes into the hospital and the first thing we have to do is we have to make sure we're not missing anything else, um, that there's nothing else going on like Andrew had mentioned before, the other diagnoses that can kind of look like cyclic vomiting syndrome as well. Once we are able to dis determine that this is a, an attack, um, then we will begin the acute care plan. So a lot of times patients come in and um, they should try to let the primary team know like, hey, I have an acute care plan I've established with my outpatient gastroenterologist. This way the emergency room who's seeing the patient first um, can initiate that. Sometimes patients um, will also require a GI consult, so our GI team will be called, because um, a lot of times these patients we know from the outpatient setting, and we'll see the patient as well and help the inpatient team um, take care of uh, patients with cyclic vomiting syndrome, because a lot of times the primary teams are still learning as well. Um, and then obviously communication with the outpatient team is important. So, um, to be, to I, I'll touch base about the, so the acute care plan, I just wanted to mention that again because it's pretty important, is that in, um, in EPIC, in our, in our computer system, um, there's a thing in the top right hand corner that shows that the patient has an acute care plan and the providers in the emergency room or on the floors, the interns, residents can click on this area and it will show what was used last time and it will be updated as needed because sometimes patients will get um, a certain dose of Ativan and then next time they have to get higher doses because it, eventually sometimes they require more and more uh, medication to help them sleep. Um, and so it usually it requires, it's IV fluids, IV Ativan, and we give a specific dose, and we can say to give it every six hours, every four hours, and then we also can give IV Zofran as well. And then we do a b complete bowel rest for about 24 hours, meaning nothing to eat or drink, just the IV fluids. So this is where the patient is hopefully sleeping. They're not eating or drinking anything. They have the IV fluids to get them through the dehydration um, for about 24 to 48 hours. And then once the patient hasn't had um, any episodes of uh, vomiting for about 24 hours or 48 hours, uh, we will then try to wake up this patient um, and slowly bring down some of these medications um, and then start to advance their diet. A lot of times the patients, I actually just ask the patients, how are you feeling? Because they know better than, than me actually when they're, because they've been through it so many times so when they're able to start trying some liquids again. So we try some clear liquids by mouth, and then if they're able to tolerate that, then we continue to titrate, meaning we start to bring all the other medications that we're giving through the IV down. Um, and then we continue to advance their diet slowly. 
So going back to our, our patient, um, so he was given a medication with his outpatient providers to help decrease the um, frequency of these attacks. Um, he uh, had worked with his team for an acute care plan so that when he came into the hospital, the, the emergency room and the medical doctors on the floor and nurses and nurse practitioners will all know um, what his plan was. And then um, he plans to graduate from college this May and he hasn't had an attack in about six months now. Um, and that's and then here are some patient resources. There's a Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome Association um, where you guys can visit that and there's resources for support groups, research, um, and that kind of thing. And we also just want to um, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Braden Kuo who's with us today. Um, and Dr. Kuo has um, NIH uh, funding to do research on Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome and has been a mentor to both Stephanie and I um, with our work, so Dr. Kuo. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to have plenty of time for questions, but I first wanted to uh, talk about some of the projects we're doing. <coughs> Cyclic vomiting is vastly underrecognized, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done to understand this unique disease process because it's partially underrecognized, and if we can better understand how these things are promoting illness, we can actually apply it to many other disease processes, such as chronic nausea vomiting and so cyclic vomiting syndrome gives us potentially a lot of insights into even more common issues. So as a result we have a number of uh, research initiatives at Mass General that are ongoing or in development including a CVS registry where we are just collecting any patient that comes through the hospital with cyclic vomiting syndrome and we're collecting their uh, patient information, tracking their medical histories over time, and even collecting uh, samples, whether it be saliva samples, stool samples, or blood samples to just track all sorts of information on them. Because knowledge is power, and collecting more information on a rare disease is helpful because uh, there is power in numbers. Along that line, uh, there's always this talk about how genetics may influence cyclic vomiting syndrome, or even the microbiome, which is a hot topic now in terms of what's going on in your GI tract. Is there a certain GI tract milieu that promotes cyclic vomiting? Can that be altered to improve cyclic vomiting? So we're uh, hoping to collect data and that information. We have an initiative here uh, that's worked on brain imaging and cyclic vomiting syndrome. The concept here is that is the brain, which could be one of the major drivers for cyclic vomiting syndrome, different compared to a healthy volunteer or somebody who has migraines, where it's thought to be a cousin, or other sorts of things. And we actually have a number of publications uh, about that sort of stuff, showing that cyclic vomiting brains uh, are a little bit different. Um, and along those lines, cyclic vomiting has been thought to be a condition where you have this period of normality and then this period of, of severe symptoms. So, and what we call that is an autonomic storm where your nerve endings and your entire body and your brain are going crazy. And so are there unique aspects to that that we can understand better through the hormonal influence or through the nervous system influence? And I think one of the biggest questions out there is because marijuana is just becoming much more commonly used out there, even uh, for a wide variety of other conditions, we know that it's used recreationally or symptomatically helpful for patients with CVS. And so what is the impact of marijuana on people who are um, of, of marijuana on people who have CVS, comparing ideally patients who never, who have CVS, who've never been exposed to marijuana, and some of those who just use it in small amounts for symptomatic use, versus others who uh, use it in extremely heavy amounts for long periods of time, and to compare, uh, you know, are there issues with the way the brain looks, it's shaped over time, and how they respond to different sorts of stimuli. So these are active, ongoing, um, projects that we're doing or planning um, and it can't occur without uh, seeing more uh, CVS patients and also uh, making them aware of these sort of projects. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the uh, Krantz family uh, who has been uh, extremely uh, generous in supporting a lot of these initiatives over at Mass General Hospital. So with that I'd like to open it up for uh, questions. We have plenty of questions uh, for people. Yes. Excuse me, Carmen. When you go to the hospital, they don't sedate them. And they're saying, you know, 
I understand. So I think one of the, uh, the most important things to just uh, reflect what you're saying is that patients with CVS, oftentimes they're extremely frustrated with the hospital experience because they, go anymore. Right, they feel they don't get the care that they need and they can just tough it out at home and not bother with all the hassles of going to the emergency or the hospital. We got $1,000 worth of bills, but not I understand. So I think the key aspect about that is getting an acute care plan in place where um, uh, the inpatient, the ER or inpatient doctor teams understand what are some of the parameters that are needed for sick and bombing syndrome. So the whole issue with Ativan is that uh, people are nervous about giving benzodiazepines in general because if you give a 0.5 or 1, I mean people typically if they've never seen them, they sleep for a week. Yeah. But you know, people who have sickly vomiting syndrome, actually 0.5 is nothing. That's like giving a person uh, a drink of water. And so they need uh, actually one to two to three milligrams every four to six hours. And that freaks out a lot of providers if they don't have any experience. But there's no information so, stating that from, from the CVS. Well, because I think that it is certainly an evolving uh, process. Um, I think we've been doing some uh, chart reviews in our system compared to hospital, our hospital system, showing that there is a um, still this concept of aggressive sedation is not mainstream. But I think that there's clear experience that it makes a difference. The challenge is, is twofold that, again, providers without any experience are extremely wary of giving that dose because they're worried about liabilities and people not breathing on these doses. And I have to tell you, the first couple years we did it, we had to spend a lot of time on the inpatient floors begging the nurses to not place the patients in intensive care units to just give them the dose. Because you give them three milligrams and they're still staring at you having a, a, a conversation. Whereas for me, three milligrams, I probably wouldn't wake up. Right. So I think the key there, again, is an acute care plan that's agreed upon by all the hospital providers. Um, and it probably stems from when patients see us in a specific cyclic vomiting expertise sort of uh, point of view, we actually hand them an acute care plan. I got to drive four hours paper. to get here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hear you. Yeah. Uh, it's not easy, but I think the point is providing an acute care plan that's written out. The providers can always call, I'll call, you know, the on doctor. A GI doctor on call at the GH because we have okay. enough experience okay. with that sort of stuff that they say yes, awesome. it's indeed in their record. So yes, it's reasonable to give this person three or four milligrams of that. Okay. But again, the challenge is sometimes when you see that much medication, if they are in the emergency room every we month it, yeah. or every week, the dose gets higher and higher and higher, and sometimes we reach the ceiling of plateau. So. It's a very careful balance that has to be achieved. And the diluted also. Like yes, so diluted is a tr tricky issue. We strongly do not like to use diluted. Okay. Instead, we actively use high doses of Ativan to okay. uh, sedate the uh, patient so that ultimately, if they're sedated, they're more comfortable, and then the need right. for diluted right. drops right. dramatically. I mean, she can, I don't mean to interrupt her. She can go through the period with and just farm it for, you know, 13, 14 hours, 15, 20 hours, whatever. And then we just wind up leaving the hospital. Where if, she, and I can't imagine what it does to the inside of everybody's body that has it. Um, but if they do sedate the patient, they're out of it in no time. I think like that can make a big difference. 14 hours versus a couple of hours you or know. one and to two days damage. in the hospital oh, versus a week in the hospital. Right. And getting them right when they come in the emergency room. So I think the acute care plan is a major factor. I also think the regular daily plan, mm -hmm. um, prophylactic medicines, everyday medicines to kind of make these attacks fewer and far between is also key in, in having the uh, patient take it every day. Um, and also if it's not working, having that conversation um, with your provider as well. There's no doubt, even though we've made suggestions here, mm -hmm. 
not one plan fits everybody. Right. The fact of the matter is, mm -hmm. there's a lot of individual variability. Some people require a lot of medicines, and they've seen a lot. Other people, just a whiff of one, and they're amazing the amount of impact it can have. Next question. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm interested in the research part. I mean, I know this is a, I understand her pain from the from having to watch her daughter deal with this for for years and years of pain and agony. I know the hospital trail really like that. But what we're really looking for is something is is some hope about the future that this won't that you won't have to go to the hospital. It'll be something to control. So I'm interested in some of the research studies. Have you made any progress? Are there ways in which you know, a, uh, a 19 year old can get involved in it and try to make a, a long term plan for a better life? Or? Sure. Well, I think there's two aspects to, the, uh, to what you're talking about. One is, you know, making sure that person is plugged into a place that's, whether it's their main GI doctor or at least having some, um, maybe once every six months or one year or just one consultative visit so they're connected somehow to either this place or there are a few other places in the country that are invested in this sort of research. Um, in terms of the in biggest impacts, number one for research has been increased awareness uh, that doctors, when they don't know what's going on, look online, not necessarily Wikipedia, but uh, <laughs> they do have their other resources to look for these sort of things. And because you're publishing about this, uh, reporting about people's experiences and registry stuff, that increased awareness filters through online so doctors can type this in and say, oh my gosh, this sounds a lot like sickening body. That's one aspect. <coughs> I think the three things down there about genetics, brain imaging, hormonal aspects, are really just trying to understand fundamentally what's going on with sickly vomiting because frankly, very little is really understood about that. But it has actually, its insights has had uh, for us some impacts into how we um, understand nausea in general and how nausea actually can be treated in a milder way compared to sickly vomiting with, uh, with drugs that can change the, the nerve endings and the sensitivity. So that's made a ba major impact for us. Uh, and I think the marijuana issue is just something that's talked about, but I think important and something that we're eager to, to begin to understand because we all know it's out there, it's heavily used, it can be beneficial. And there's a stigma that's being fought, I think overall, with CDS patients stigma with regards to pain medication, with regards to the amount of medications they need for sedation without a van, and with regards to marijuana. And I think all those aspects are important to, uh, to sort of understand and then get the word out. Good question. Um, I, believe I want to introduce uh, Mariana. Yes, Stan. She is uh, one of the research coordinators. If you uh, would like to uh, be contacted potentially about research studies, whether it's the registry or other sorts of things. Feel free to find her afterwards and give her your information. She'll hold it in the database and uh, she can reach out to you as these things start to go further online. So spreading the word about like the work I think we're doing, but just overall cyclic <coughs> vomiting and helping it become recognized because we know um, the cyclic vomiting community is growing. So, um, you know, I think getting more recognition and more research to understand um, is definitely paving some of the way here. So, it's excellent. So I can actually have my hospital call this hospital? Yeah, yep. If, Seriously. I mean, well, I, what I, I would say, it. I mean, what I would say, um, you know, I know it's a little awkward, just hey, well, I just happen to be in another emergency room, but what I would say is, um, if patients have been seen here and they happen to be in a local ER, it's not uncommon the local ER will call a doctor on call here saying, hey, this, we have a patient that was seen by you once for sickly vomiting, and we just wanted to run thoughts about our management. That's very common. You get phone calls about patient of yours you've seen once as an emergency room. We're doing this, but either the patient wanted you to call us to call you, or we just want to make sure we're doing the right thing to, uh, to to do uh, best by this patient. And that, you know, uh, they can, the doctors here can look in the patient's records and see all the acute care plan issues and all the uh, things that we thought about to try to uh, make an impact on the patient. Right. <laughs> we'll stay here for a week. Yes. 
Uh, my <coughs> young adult daughter um, does have an acute care, has CBS and does have an acute care plan, which is very helpful in hospitals. Um, however, she uh, came to begin hallucinating from the Ativan. Is there an IV alternative to Ativan for sedation? So, um, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, with medications is everybody is so individual in how they respond to the medications. And what we've talked about seems nice and ideal, but I think part of the reason why people come to us is uh, they don't fit the cookbook uh, sort of recipe and we have to get creative. And so I think some of the common issues with Ativan when you get to higher doses is tolerance, uh, that one or two milligrams is not enough and we have to use other sorts of medicines along the prophylactic side to try to decrease uh, the need for the use of Ativan. So that's one aspect. Um, there are other drugs uh, like Ativan, but not quite benzodiazepines, Haldol, Thorazine. They're not great because they also have side effect issues. And so part of our goal really is, even though we know we might have to use Ativan, is to really ramp up the prophylactic side as high as we can uh, ramp it up, or even begin some of that if it hasn't started in the prodromal phase to try to decrease the needs for some of these acute medicines, which I would totally agree are not great for long term. They're meant for acute and hopefully only just intermittent use. Well, I was referring to in the hospital. Like I understand. So, use of adamant, right. So um, there are some challenges to that. Haldol could be used or Thorazine, but they have their own issues. Or it's to ramp up some of the prophylactic medicines in patient higher to try to bridge that, that process. Yes? Uh, and uh, I, have a, I do have CBS, I'm a patient, and the acute care plan has been wonderful. It's excellent. One of the challenges that I find, though, is once, we're, once I'm in inpatient, and almost like needing the acute care plan for that process with the doctors, we always have rotating doctors, we don't have consistency, and then the discharge process, because there have been times where I've had to come in again that afternoon and get an extended stay. Well, I think that, you know, um, uh, we talked about how these processes can be helpful, but, you know, sometimes every situation is unique, and uh, sometimes we do, because of our expertise, get cases that are, are more challenging, that uh, we have to just try to do our best to work harder in terms of I think treating. having the building blocks, you know, having that acute care plan, you know, I know every, every place is, is different, but I can't emphasize enough that eight or nine years ago, you know, we were going to inpatient floors late into the evening and, you know, Steph has been an amazing addition to the team and she's been here very senior. She's been here for, you know, over five years now. So I think having that is, is progress in many ways, but I think across the board, whether it's at Mass General or other institutions, that recognition and kind of seeing what cyclic vomiting is, is so important. So having that acute care plan, at least as a building block, and seeing what further inroads we can make is, is the direction we're heading. And I'm actually very encouraged that we're making the progress that we are. But as Dr. Quo mentioned, you know, we certainly, with, through our research, um, can make much more. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, my son has it on a schedule. Like every, probably, either this night or tomorrow, 12 weeks. And it's been like that for years. Is that common? Uh, there have been reports about that. Um, there are reports about women getting it sort of during uh, a longer cycle. Um, some people we notice get it on cycle, basically when exams start hitting. <laughs> yeah. uh, the stress factors, whether that all culminates into some sort of cyclical pattern can happen. Um, so there are questions about the, the cycle process. We've seen patterns like this, but the triggers are very individual. Yeah, you know, I can, I can put it on a calendar now. Hmm. It's going to be this week, July. Yeah. The one thing I would say about like that weeks. is yeah. that if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have that level of predictability, then it's possible maybe that uh, you can anticipate by building up on the pro uh, uh mm -hmm. process. Because at the end of the day, no matter what we do, we tell patients we're not going to make you never have another attack again for the rest of your life. And that's the point is that 
to understand that it will occur. But there are options to try to make things better, either by decreasing the frequencies or severity, or when you're having an attack, trying to minimize it as much as possible to prevent it from going all the way up. And so I would argue if you're blessed with knowing it's exactly every 12 yeah. weeks, that Friday, the 13th, yeah. then maybe that is a time that you need to uh, exactly. ramp up that uh, yeah. control yeah. in anticipation. Yeah. I think another common thing is, you know, CVS patients are so tough <coughs> for what they've been through, but sometimes um, it works against them because they want to tough out a process rather than let uh, the process um, help them through. And that's particularly happens when they, um, uh, and I understand that you're working and you realize you're having an attack, you want to push through the work because you're worried about losing your job, but really the harder you fight that process rather than allowing uh, of the, uh, uh, the prodromal aggressive self-sedation process to work, the faster you recover. And so that if you fight it, you might be fighting it for three days, whereas if you let it go and let yourself be appropriately treated, you might recover faster and get to work more productively faster. But I think um, it definitely uh, is a unique group of patients that are suffering a lot. And just to add on to that too, I think one thing we talked a lot about medications and procedures and ways for dealing with patients with cyclic vomiting, but really the cognitive behavioral therapy piece as well. So a lot of patients will come in and say, I've been told this is all in my head and you know, nobody understands because they can't physically see this as a disorder. And then, right, exactly. So I think to just have that acceptance as a, as a patient, and it's not easy, but to perhaps consider even having just a cognitive behavioral therapy outlet because as much as those neurotransmitters I talked about in the brain that are affected by medications, they're also very much affected by having a more structured approach. Um, and even like gut hypnotherapy, we're starting to initiate some of that in our practice. Um, so ways of like allowing for an outlet because it is not easy. I mean, and we know we have patients on the inpatient side, but also coming outpatient that are actually in a flare, having a cyclic vomiting syndrome episode in our offices. And so we're using those techniques in the clinic all the time. So making sure you're connected medicinally um, with a gastroenterologist, but also with a psychiatrist and psychologist is to your advantage and not a label. So we just want to emphasize that as well. And do you guys promote the medications for everybody to take on a daily basis? I, I don't take anything anymore. It's made my life worse. And I have no warning signs. I wake up soaked in a full sweat and it's mm. there. Well, I think, again, every case is individual. Um, we generally do uh, promote a uh, prophylactic sort of everyday approach. In Even hopes. though it upsets you, they pulled my gallbladder, everything makes me nauseous, diarrhea, vomiting, no matter what I take. So but it's interesting you say that because we, so a lot of patients, um, anyway, one way of looking at it is it's like walking on a tight, uh, tight rope and that anything can set off their attack, but as a result, any sort of change, including medications, they can be very sensitive to. And so one of our strategies for that individualization is that most doctors are starting at the cookie cutter 25 milligrams, 50 milligrams, and that's giving people side effects immediately, so they don't want to take it because it's negative reinforcement. And we find by dialing the dose way, 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 way down, probably to doses that may not make a difference, but frankly, it does make a difference because they can take the medicine at the low doses that most doctors wouldn't even think work. Even though everything causes you nausea, you're still suggesting that we should take it. Uh, so the question is, right, so the question is uh, potentially, and you know, I don't know your case specifically, but a common situation is we see patients where we use gabapentin. I know gabapentin causes a lot of side effects, uh, but the doses that are usually started are around 100 milligrams once a day or two times a day, and that can give still up to 30% of patients <coughs> problems. But we actually uh, consider starting people at 25 milligrams liquid, way, way, way low doses, which most doctors would think well, it doesn't even do anything. And we find actually it builds tolerance and confidence that the medication can at least be tolerated, and it actually uh, has made an impact because they can tolerate the medication and move forward. So I should actually find another primary because every time I go, she tells me it's in my head and she's pushing in antidepressants on so me. I think yeah. that also goes down the same line of just lack of potentially understanding and it's your providers really want to help you. I think we hear from primary cares all the time. I really want to help this patient. 
I just don't know how. Well, she said so, this in my head, and then, like, I mean, I've had tragic things happening, and I get sick eight months after the fact, and she'll tell me it's, oh, it's a real delayed reaction from what happened eight months ago. So I, I would take it as a great opportunity to, to help educate, and then, you know, perhaps a second opinion um, with more a gastroenterologist is a good start, um, because I think more thinking of the fact that, again, it's really under-recognized. I mean, we have lots of primary care and, and even gastroenterology colleagues that are not as aware of a cyclic vomiting just because, again, there's not a lot of research. No. It's like you're afraid there. of life. You don't want to do anything because you don't know what tomorrow's going to have because there's no warning signs of anything to come. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the biggest aspect is the loss of control mm -hmm. of your life. And there so, is. Yeah. It's like I live in the house all day. You don't want to leave. You don't want to go anywhere. You have to know where the next bathroom is before you walk out the front door. So the whole approach here with a prophylaxis is to try to get a regimen that's tolerated to try to claw back some semblance of control of your life. Now, excuse me, what about a neurologist? So I think neurology certainly has a role to play, particularly because a lot of these patients have migraine disorders, which is treated by neurologists. And at the end of the day, we believe that this is a disorder of nerve endings in the gut and in the brain. And so there's this whole concept of neurogastroenterology. So having neurology input is very reasonable. Well, thank you very much for all this uh, lively discussion. We really appreciate it.